welcome all to the network operation session. Uh, we have almost a 15 minute delay. Uh, before further ado, I, I would like to uh, introduce our, we have four presentations today, line up. Uh, first, Marike, uh, um, Jonathan, and Jeff Hostan. So further to you, uh, I'll invite uh, uh, Marike Kayo to start the presentation. I guess while we wait for the slides to get shown, uh, my name is Medica Keo. I'm very happy to be back in Sri Lanka. My first time was actually back in 2003 at Sanok 2, and much has changed in 13 years, and it's nice to see. So my talk is gonna be on IPv6 security, uh, and basically is IPv6 security. And you know, I'll cut all the way to the end. Yes, it is and it really shouldn't be, and part of my goal for the next 15 minutes, I was told I had 15 and not 20, um, is to make you guys really care and understand what are some of the basic and more fundamental considerations um, in deploying IPv6 networks securely. So the main goals are understanding the fundamental IPv6 security considerations, knowing the right questions to ask, Admitting that practical IPv6 malware detection and mitigation needs work, okay? It's okay that it needs work, but let's just make the right decisions and help each other out. And also learning how DNS can be utilized to help with IPv6 malware detection. So do the operational environments understand IPv6? I will say not very often, okay? We have been in this world of IPv6 is coming, do we need it, why do we need it? Security is built in. There's been a lot of confusion about it. Because of the IPv4 address depletion, there is no other way. We have to go to IPv6 networks. And what I can encourage you all to do is start at least playing with IPv6 if you haven't already. Because the biggest thing in my mind when I started first um, playing with it and you know um, learning about it in the lab was it took me a long time to understand the addressing because I was so familiar with IPv4. And so it's very much, I mean, IPv4 and IPv6 have a lot of similarities, but there are some nuances that you really need to think about, and especially when it comes to security. So the primary one is that there are more, IP, um, there are more addresses that uh, are utilized in an IPv6 host. So whereas IPv4, you basically typically have a global address, you know, sometimes it's a private address. With IPv6, um, each interface has multiple addresses. So there's certain multicast addresses depending on what kind of device it is. Um, you have a link local address, you have a global address, you might have a privacy address, and understanding which address is used as the source to generate traffic is something that's really important to know and identify. There's also other IPv6 nuances. Um, I worked in a mobile environment for a while and I was really surprised to know that every mobile device is a slash 64. So when my mobile uh, telephone went to sleep, when I woke it up again, it had a totally new slash 128 address because it had a new internet identifier a new slash 64-bit uh, internet identifier. And so that was really interesting to me because I didn't know that. It didn't really make sense to me, but that's what the standard you know, says. There are mobile carriers that try to be more efficient with address space. That's not per standard, and some of them have run into trouble with that. But just you know, understand that because it comes into play when you deal with logging and auditing. You, know, you may not have to log and audit 
a slash 128, I mean, might be that the slash 64 is good enough because you can identify the device that way. Um, extension headers. Extension headers are a huge controversy. And I had a discussion with somebody yesterday where they said, oh, I'm glad that I learned that, you know, I need to drop all packets with extension headers. I'm like, oh, no, please don't. Right? Operators are dropping packets with extension headers, but fragmentation uses extension headers. And so this will cause other issues, such as DNSSEC, right? Because if the packet's big and gets fragmented, then, you know, are you going to be able to use DNSSEC in the future, right? These are things that you have to think about and the nuances. So don't just go, you know, oh yeah, everybody else is doing it. Really learn about what the impact is in your networks. Um, I'll talk a little bit about path MTU discovery when I talk about ICMP, but just realize that while IPv4 and IPv6 aren't compatible, there's a lot of similarities between the two um, transports, and there's just some specific nuances that you have to think about, um, specifically the multiple addresses per interface and extension headers that you have to take into consideration for security issues. So the fundamental security issues always remain the same. You want to deal with authentication, authorization, integrity, confidentiality, and availability. That stays the same no matter what kind of network you have. And then, of course, when you're looking at, you know, how do you monitor an audit, which is always a concern, uh, security concern, you want to look at how does that impact privacy. So I'm a co-author of an IETF draft, um, and if you use your favorite search engine and type in the draft IETF OPSEC V609, you will get that document. It's about 9,200 pages, and what it attempts to do is to write down all of the best practices and nuances for dealing with security in an IPv6 network. So my other two co-authors, um, one was instrumental at um, uh, building IPv6 out at Google. Um, the other one is an engineer at Cisco who has written many books and has a lot of practical experience and I had a lot of practical experience from my consulting days. So um, I won't go through all these because of time, but I would encourage you to read this document because no network is ever cookie cutter, and what we tried to do was lay out with these particular categories the considerations that you, sh you should think about when you're trying to secure your IPv6 deployments. One of the main things to think about is that a lot of people use NetFlow. It, it surprises me sometimes that people still aren't aware that you have to use NetFlow version 9 right, to actually use NetFlow in IPv6 environments. So a lot of people still run NetFlow 5. If you want to have NetFlow information for IPv6, it has to be NetFlow version 9. And that has been around for at least 12 years. So just know that these are the things that you need to think about because you need to audit or monitor your networks. So DDoS. There is a growing trend in DDoS. So a big problem is there really are a lot of spoofed IP addresses still utilized in the networks. Um, the one thing that I will really ask you to do is filter in your networks. I think that whenever I gave security workshops, the one thing that I always emphasized was filtering, be it packet filtering or route filtering, because nobody or very few people do it effectively. Okay? There are some networks that really pay attention. You want to filter. And this is true for IPv4 and IPv6. And I will make the comment that mobile networks and Internet of Things needs attention. And the very last bullet, I don't know how many of you here in this region have heard about this DDoS attack, but Brian Krebs, right, a very well-known security blogger, was DDoS. He had 600 gigabits um, uh, of traffic sent his way, where literally Akamai said, you know, we can't support this anymore, and he had to go find a new provider. And actually, last night, they finally, um, they actually divulged 
or it became public knowledge that the um, malware that was utilized is called Mirai, and it, ex it exploits weak default credentials. This has nothing to do with IPv6, but still it impacts IPv4 or IPv6 environments, and I am boggled that so many people or so many devices still use default passwords. What's even worse, that it utilized Telnet, right? I mean, why would a device in this day and age have Telnet on by default? I know a couple that do. That's a huge problem. So I know people always make fun of me when I show this, and my friends are like, really, you did this? I bought a TV last fall, and my criteria was, does it support IPv6? Okay, and I have light bulbs at home that they don't yet support IPv6, but hopefully soon. They do do firmware updates. But the thing that was interesting to me, I bought that with that criteria in mind, then, you know, the folks install it, and it's an Android device. I didn't even think to look at that, right? And so before I ended up connecting it to my Wi-Fi network, I looked at what is on by default, right? And I found that, you know, there are certain things that are set on by default, like send them, send them, somebody, location information, other information that I consider private. And then I started thinking that, well, what if my television was, um, you know, vulnerable to some kind of an attack, and my television would be used as a denial of service um, host, right? which from the Mirai uh, uh, malware, we now know that a lot of Internet of Things devices, cameras and, and, and other devices in the home were used to also generate the traffic that was part of this botnet or this malware, the DDoS malware. So this is real. And so why am I saying this? You know, here's also something. This is old. This is 20 years old, the Smurf attack, right? And he used, uh, uh, basically, um, broadcasted ICMP echo requests with spoof addresses to then uh, um, um, overwhelm some victim, right? Who, whoever had the address of that spoofed IP address. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this particular attack um, caused a lot of people to just turn off ICMP. They just filtered all of ICMP because they're like, you know, I don't want this to impact me and my IPv4 network. So when people are deploying IPv6 networks, they're saying, oh yeah, I need feature compatibility. So what did people do in the beginning? Well, they also filtered all of ICMP and v6, and they were wondering why nothing worked, right? So with IPv6, you have specific ICMP um, uh, types that are necessary for the normal operation of IPv6 networks. So I have this table here that's your cheat sheet. You know, if you want to actually specifically permit um, these types of uh, ICMP packets that deny everything else, in my experience from running IPv6 networks and helping people deploy them in the last 10 years, I've come to the conclusion that I wouldn't filter ICMP because people just make too many mistakes. I always show this slide because it shows filtering. So a lot of people talk about BCP38. BCP38 primarily is for ISPs to do ingress filtering. So you filter on packets that um, are inbound to you that have this, uh, the address space that you've allocated, everything else you drop. And so, but I, if to do anti-spoofing correctly, I think we all have a role to play. So I think uh, you also have to do egress filtering. So for example, in my home, the home customer, I know that I have a pretty extensive lab in my home network, and I want to make sure that I'm only sourcing packets that have the um, IP uh, v6 address as the source right, for any packets that I send upstream to my ISP. And so I want to do my part just in case I make some kind of an error in my test environment or, you know, should I somehow get compromised and somebody's trying to use my test devices to then generate traffic. So this is an example. And, you know, again, I, I would very strongly encourage you to look at filtering. 
I show this again. It's, uh, I make things easy for, for people where there's a specific RFC that talks about uh, reserved IPv4 and IPv6 address space. These IPv6 addresses are reserved and should never be seen in the global internet. Reality, they are seen in the global internet. Why? People don't filter. They test stuff, they don't do filtering, and you have all kinds of garbage on the internet. So please, let's do our part and let's, let's, let's provide some of these filters. So DNS, one of the things that has kept me up at night for a very long time is thinking about, well, if I was trying to do something malicious, right, how would I utilize IPv4 and or IPv6 traffic and kind of stay below the radar? And so while there hasn't yet been any IPv6 malware that's been utilized, okay, that I am aware of, and I, I do pay attention. I mean, I whisper in all kinds of corners to find out if anybody's seen anything, but there hasn't been yet. But for a long time, I thought that, you know, the one unifying factor is DNS. And so there's a technology called passive DNS where people are um, building databases from cache missed traffic. And I'll show you a slide on that um, in a bit if you're not familiar with that. And then once you have some information, either that a domain is part of a, a malware or IPv4 address or IPv6 address, you can then pivot off of each of these pieces of information to then get the full story. So for those of you that are not pa uh, familiar with passive DNS, it's basically cache misses. And how that works is that you have a client, right, it goes through its recursive resolver, um, asks whether or not, hey, do you know where um, www.nsrc.org is? Because, you know, I want to look at some of the tutorials that they've built. And if uh, the, um, the IP address for that particular server is not in the cache, then it goes and does the normal IP, uh, DNS operation, right, gets the information, stores it, stores it in the cache, and then when the second host does the query, it will then just give the answer from the cache. So the passive DNS that's collected, that's from cache misses, is the queries and responses that are going from the DNS recursive resolver to the authoritative server. So it doesn't impact PII because it's above the recursor. So here's a couple of searches, right? And I, I was just kind of looking randomly to see, hey, is there any you know, IPv6 data in the database that, that we provide at Farsight? And, you know, if you look here, I mean, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, it's too small. But basically, it's a 2001 DB8 address, right, which is a documentation address. So if I do a search just on the, the actual IPv6 address, the documentation address, I do see a lot of hits. And primarily, I see a lot of test networks and all that. But, you know, again, you see that information. And... At one point, I was trying to find whether or not there was actually any IPv6 related malware. And so I used one of my spam emails, you know, and did a couple of data searches on there. I actually found some IPv6 addresses on there, but again, it was an IPv4 uh, compatible address that should never be seen on the global internet. But what I wanted to do was show you an example where, you know, you can pivot off of an IPv4 address that you may know that's actually part of some malware campaigns. And then if it also has a, um, a quad A record associated with that, then you can do more searches on that actually IPv6 address, find out what other um, domains are associated with that, and then find out the, the um, similarities and differences between IPv4 and IPv6 in the domain space. So any kind of further information, I would actually have correlated the IPv4 and the IPv4 mapped address. The IPv4 mapped address was an IPv6 address. And then both were associated with over 10,000 domains, but they weren't associated one-to-one. -one. And so, you know, I'd want to see which of the domains were seen in IPv4 and IPv6, or which ones were only seen in IPv4 and only seen in IPv6 and try to figure out that entire malware campaign. 
So, you know, the main point here is that passive DNS can be used to correlate IPv4 and IPv6 related information. And so some operational observations are that IPv6 attacks are known but not discussed. Um, I know folks that run IPv6 uh, honeypots and they do see some traffic. Um, and there's a lot of malware families that do have a checkbox for enable IPv6. But probably because, you know, they're, it's not so successful, we don't have that full-blown connectivity in IPv6 that the malware community isn't really widely using it. Um, and the honeypots that actually see some traffic, their thinking is that it's probably just dual stack clients who are trying to connect to the uh, command and control server using a quad A record. So it's not that you're actually seeing any kind of malware that's using IPv6, but it's rather the end hosts of the dual stack that are trying to use the quad A record first to connect to the uh, malware domain. So how do you mitigate most threats? Um, and this is really true for IPv4 and IPv6, but I want to reiterate this because people do not do the fundamentals. And so I don't want you to blame something on IPv6 when really you would have had the same issue in IPv4. So fundamentally, right, secure your end host, right, a router and switch is the end host, so is a CP device. Turn off all unused services. If you don't use Telnet, turn it off. Make sure that it's not on by default. Change all default credentials and use two-factor authentication where you can. And use cryptographically protected protocols for management. I don't even like to see TFTP. I'm like, why don't you do secure copy? Right? There should be no unprotect I mean, no non-cryptographically protected protocols anywhere managing your device. Um, you want to limit access to your network. That's filtering, either doing packet filtering, doing unicast reverse path, path forwarding, doing route filtering. And do both ingress and egress filtering where it's necessary in your network. Authenticate, right? Device versus user, right? Just because you have an IP address, if it's shared amongst a lot of different people, right? I mean, make sure that you understand whether or not you're authenticating using device credential or device, um, sorry, identity, IP address, or actually a username. Credential management lifecycle, everybody does it poorly. When people talk about encrypt everything, I'm always like, what do you do when you lose your key? Do you lose your data? Right, so think about credential management lifecycle. How do you create credentials? How do you destroy them? How do you distribute them? How do you revoke them? I mean, that entire life cycle you have to think about. And use multi-factor authentication, can't, can't stress that enough. And then also audit network traffic, right? So in a V4, uh, V6 environment, use NetFlow version 9 or SFlow. And also use Wireshark on occasion. People laugh at me, but you know, I want to make sure that what goes out of my network or out of my machines, that it's encrypted when I think it's encrypted. Right? There's bugs everywhere, or you know, people make configuration uh, uh, mistakes. See what's on the wire. And see what's on the wire also to get to know what your network looks like and what normal looks like in terms of your tra traffic flow. So whatever tools you have, but look at what's on your network. Begin to recognize what the data patterns are. Because you, know, you want to understand anomalies. And if there's a blip and it's an anomaly, don't just say, oh yeah, it just happened for like 10 minutes and I don't have to think about it. Because I know from a very large provider, it was either a year or two ago, they had a blip, nobody thought about it. Three months later, they were hit with a large attack. Right? That was a test. Had they paid attention, they may not have been hit that hard with the attack that happened three months later. So trust but verify, understand what monitoring capability is for IPv6 and or IPv4 uh, traffic. And I can't stress this enough. With IPv6, understand what monitoring capabilities you do have because there is work to be done. Um, test the dual stack and transition technologies. There's many of them. If you can, go native as soon as possible. That is my, my first and foremost recommendation. Um, and correlation is important. And I hope I didn't go too much over. So, thank you.
Thank you, Mark. Okay. I'll further to I'll ask Jonathan to continue his presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Kia ora. John Brewer here. I'm a network engineer based in Wellington, New Zealand, and uh, this is part of a larger body of work um, funded by ISIF uh, Asia, which is a um, grant that uh, is supported by ISOC and APNIC and uh, I think the Swedish Registrar and a number of other organizations throughout the world, and uh, the University of Oregon's Network Startup Resource Center. Um, so I got involved with the Pacific through PACNOG, which happens twice a year, uh, changing Pacific Islands each time. Uh, I go out and act as a trainer. I've been to six so far, um, giving workshops on uh, network monitoring and management on wireless and a couple times on network security. Um, and I have met some fantastic, interesting, wonderful, lovely people. I've also run into um, problems of poor performance, even uh, on islands where brand new cable infrastructure has been uh, put in place. Exceptionally uh, poor performance in between two networks in the same countries, and this happens in multiple islands. Very little emphasis on research and education networking. It is an afterthought in the Pacific. Um, no consideration for traffic to regional peers or regional trading partners. Uh, even though some islands work closely together, their internet traffic doesn't uh, follow a logical route. Um, nobody thinks about um, who their major trading partners are when they make uh, internet uh, architecture decisions. And I found that there's a focus on purchasing the cheapest capacity available, um, even if that capacity may not be good internet connectivity. So um, this is a, is it gonna play? There we go. This is a video that condenses uh, about 20 minutes of a talk I've done previously and shows the build-in of cable infrastructure into the Pacific. Um, Hawaii 5 and 93, Pakram West in 95. Uh, we've got a cable going across to China, little feeder, Timuran is in Guam, Guam in the Philippines. This, we, we started in the early 90s with nothing. And in a period of around 10 years, we got to the point where we had Southern Cross Cable uh, connecting and uh, a good web of cables between Guam, Hawaii, the west coast of the US, and uh, Japan and Australia. And then in the last 10 years, we've started to build into the Pacific Islands uh, with some cables connecting uh, New Caledonia and uh, Samoa, connecting uh, Tonga and uh, uh, FSM, Marshall Islands, French Polynesia. Uh, yeah, and so you see all these. Boy, that's kind of hard to see. That's all right. You see all these building in. And, um, and now, uh, two years ago, we have a satellite network called O3B. And O3B is unique because it sits uh, only 8,000 kilometers above Earth, as opposed to typical geostationary, which are up at 36,000 kilometers. That means the latency on O3B can be quite reasonable. Uh, between two islands can be around 110 milliseconds, which is a very, very usable product. And it's a broadband product uh, delivering connections of up to 1.4 gigabit per second. So um, that's made a real change for a lot of Pacific Islands. Anyway, um, talking about that latency, there's this old saying that when people are shopping for cars, um, people buy horsepower, but then they drive torque. You, um, you buy a, a car that um, has a lot of horsepower and uh, you can't apply that to the road, uh, you don't go anywhere fast. The same thing happens with um, internet capacity. People buy megabits, you know, they wanna buy a 100 megabit per second connection. But if the latency on that connection is really high, um, they'll be miserable. You know, people have some new satellite connections that are 25 megabits per second down, but if they click and they have to wait, 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 wait for the web page to load, they don't think it's fast. Um, there is a, a window of human reaction time, around 250 milliseconds is where average people um, can perceive uh, something. And if it's much faster, much slower than that, people think, oh, it's slow, it's slow. And this graph is built up of 24 million tests, million reaction tests on human subjects. So this is uh, across the population. Um, once you get up to say, 300, 320, 340 milliseconds, most people are gonna say, oh, there's been a delay. Now, with all of these cables in the Pacific, we could have a connectivity environment where nobody notices a delay everywhere. 
everywhere. I mean, we've got latencies like 40 some milliseconds between Samoa and Hawaii, almost 50 between French Polynesia and Hawaii, uh, 67 from Guam to Hawaii. These are very low latencies, but um, well, we'll see in a bit, that's not actually what's happening. I built a network of latency observers using the open source tool Smokeping at virtual machines co-located with cable landing stations around the Pacific. You can see them all here. Mumbai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Seoul, Tokyo, Honolulu, Seattle, Portland, San Jose, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Sydney, and Auckland. So I've got Smokeping latency uh, servers there, and each one of these servers is tracking 77 different network operators within the Pacific. So I've got a real good picture of how everybody is performing from all sorts of places around the Pacific Rim. Uh, 15 servers, 12 in Asia Pac, 77 networks. I've got between six and 18 months of data available for all of the networks, and uh, as part of this project, or part of an extension to this project, I'm gonna make that data available to the public in real time. Now here's a picture uh, of what I've seen. If I remember correctly, this is transit from Guam to uh, Hawaii. So this is Guam as measured from Honolulu on one of the telcos there. And we can see that at some times uh, it's been near to the ideal, which is 70 milliseconds. Uh, at other times it's gone way up, which means it's routing via Australia or the US, something crazy like that, um, back to normal and then um, we've got this situation now where we're hitting around 150 milliseconds, which, which is hard to make some sense of, but we'll get back to that. So in theory, Hawaii, in theory, getting from Hawaii, which considers itself to be a hub of the Pacific, getting to other Pacific islands, um, we should be able to get everywhere within, say, about 240 milliseconds. On this chart, green is less than 80 milliseconds, light green is up to 160, yellow is up to 240, and we've got little Nui there who are the only island uh, on this map that are on a geostationary satellite. Everybody else is either on uh, an O3B type medium Earth orbit satellite or on a direct fiber connection. In practice, wow, okay, almost everybody is in the 160 to 240 millisecond um, range. Almost everybody from, from Hawaii, all the carriers. Um, and it turns out that all of the data is going back to the US first. Um, not even going from Hawaii to Sydney to the islands. It's actually all going back to the west coast and then through the same cables through Hawaii to get back out to the Pacific, but um, at, at layer three, it goes the long way. In theory, Sydney, which is also quite a hub for the Pacific, um, Sydney and Brisbane are where you fly to Pacific Islands from, direct flights, where shipping traffic comes from, uh, where commercial re relationships are established. Um, yeah, you should be able to get to uh, New Caledonia pretty fast, of course, PNG pretty fast. Uh, you should have reasonable latencies to um, Vanuatu, Fiji, Sydney, uh, sorry, Tonga, Hawaii, French Polynesia. Uh, yeah, wow, look at that. So, um, French Polynesia, 230, 240 to 320 milliseconds. What's happening? The traffic is going from Sydney to Oregon to Los Angeles to Hawaii to French Polynesia. Ouch. Uh, Guam. You should be able to get, you can get from Sydney to Guam directly on two different submarine cables and yet the traffic goes from Sydney to Los Angeles to Guam or Sydney to Los Angeles to Tokyo to Guam to get there. This is how people have purchased their transit even though they have the cable resources available for quicker connections. Uh, so I know about how these um, paths, how this data is routing, not because of my smoke ping servers but because of probes I have distributed throughout the Pacific from the RIPE Atlas project. So RIPE is a network of probes that you can use to measure internet connectivity and reachability. You can use a few different protocols like DNS, HTTP, ICMP, NTP, uh, and the V6 variants of this if the networks support IPv6. There are a lot of probes. Um, this slide is 10 months old. 10 months ago, there were 9,200 active probes throughout the world. If you see this string of green pearls throughout the Pacific, um, I would say that the ISIF-funded project um, that I've been working on is responsible for 80% of those or more. So here are uh, some of the measurements. Here's a, a snapshot from the Atlas uh, interface, and here's a trace route going from 
Guam to Saipan. And oh, from all of the Guam carriers to Saipan. This is a great example. Saipan is connected to Guam via submarine cable directly. It should have around six to seven milliseconds latency. And you can see in the diagram below that AS7131 and AS9246 uh, on these networks, it's possible to connect sub 10 milliseconds. You've got five milliseconds, half a millisecond, and 6.4 milliseconds. Okay. Um, we should trust the five and six millisecond readings. And we've got these other carriers that to get to an island which is less than 100 kilometers away are taking 275, 268, and 287. This is because the local carriers there don't interconnect. They don't like each other, so they send their traffic all the way back to the US to go 100 Ks. Crazy. Um, here's a picture of, of that uh, using um, uh, I IXP Jedi, a tool written by Emil Aben from RIPE, who, is he here? I thought he was going to be on the program. I haven't seen him. Anyway, um, this every month takes a measurement of how uh, ISPs are connected to each other. If they're connected locally, as in uh, low latency connection, you've got a green. If they're connected overseas, you've got a red. In this case, we've got iConnect sending all of their traffic on level three. Uh, straight back to the US and they're connecting with everybody in the US. Um, PDS is connecting with Docomo overseas, connecting with GTA and IT&T locally. So this is the state of things uh, a year ago, this is the state of things now, uh, hasn't changed. Marshall Islands, this was really funny, I showed this slide at Pacnog in Guam last year and uh, the guy at Docomo said, that's not true. We connect directly with Minta in Guam. We're not going overseas. And I said, well, look, I've got the data. And he went off all angry and he came back to me and he said, oh, the BGP session had fallen over six weeks ago and nobody noticed. So it was taking, traffic was taking default route all the way back to the States, interconnecting in Seattle, coming back via Tokyo, something ridiculous. So, Yes, they intended to do it right, but they weren't because they screwed up. Uh, another example um, that I'm seeing is asymmetric routing because uh, carriers, uh, some of them don't understand how BGP works. Um, some of them don't understand traffic engineering. Uh, we've got a carrier in Guam who takes a full table in Guam but doesn't advertise any routes there. So the world sees uh, all of the Guam carrier's routes in Los Angeles. Uh, and the Guam carrier um, picks up routes both in Los Angeles and in Hawaii. So some traffic travels from Hawaii to uh, Guam and then Guam to Los Angeles and then Los Angeles to Hawaii in a big loop like that. And that's how you see funny latency figures that don't quite add up to the um, uh, numbers that you'd see in direct cable connections or direct paths. So uh, what am I going to do with all this data? Every time I interview a carrier, and I've inter interviewed more than 40 carriers in the Pacific, every time I interview them, they say, what are you going to do with this data? What do you want with the data from the Atlas probe? Why are you asking me these questions? Uh, we want to help. Uh, we want to help carriers, universities, uh, governments understand where their net network traffic is going. Um, who the top talkers are to their networks, so help them understand their net flow, help them understand if their customers are being well served, uh, and local peering is important to serving your customers well, especially in these days of peer-to-peer -peer applications like Skype and voice over IP and e-learning applications. Um, are you planning your capacity purchasing based on data, or are you just buying on a salesperson's recommendation? We want to help um, Carriers especially and governments understanding that all transit is not equal. Uh, ran into the case of a carrier in Fiji who purchased a direct connection to Los Angeles, but their direct connection was actually going from Fiji to Sydney and then from Sydney to Seattle and then from Seattle down to Los Angeles. So they had this layer two point to point connection between Fiji and Los Angeles and the latency was just ridiculously high. And they couldn't do anything about it because when they bought the capacity, all they said is we want a point to point connection. And the carrier said, okay, here you go. We've got some cheap capacity. We'll get rid of it in a way that's very advantageous to us. So a lack of understanding um, leads to uh, these poor transit purchase strategies. Um, another thing is that 
a lot of carriers don't make uh, agreements that predict growth. They don't under understand. They really don't think that it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, and it's going to. You've got to plan for that. Um, and also, there's a lack of understanding of peering strategies that we need to help uh, people with, because when you say peering in the Pacific, people think open, free peering point, and they say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. But honestly, peering is as simple as a bilateral agreement between two carriers, and that may be a settled agreement. It is peering if you're settling. You can say, I'm going to pay you for the asymmetric uh, traffic volumes, or I'm going to pay you for the asymmetric investment involved in the two networks. One network may cover a metro area of one island. Another network may cover all of the rural areas of 100 different islands. Now, who spent more on which network? Which network is more valuable? there should be some paid settlement between those networks. They shouldn't be forced to peer for free. We have to help people understand that and help people understand the value of networks. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Uh, we need to help carriers, governments, and universities understand uh, CDN content. CDN content is available in the Pacific, in Sydney, in Tokyo. You do not need to buy a circuit to Los Angeles to get your Facebook, to get your Netflix, to get your Twitter, to get your major components of your traffic. Carriers in Guam have a very low cost, very low latency path to Tokyo. It's less than 30 milliseconds to Tokyo where all of these organizations have capacity. They could peer in Tokyo, pick up this traffic for free, but instead they choose to purchase circuits all the way back to California. And I'm not talking about one carrier or two carriers, I'm talking about all four of the majors and the small guy. They all buy capacity straight back to the US. Closer content is cheaper, closer content is faster, it takes less network resources, it's just better. And of course, latency matters um, for CDNs and streaming media. A lot of uh, CDN providers uh, have uh, restrictions on TCP windows because it helps them serve more customers from their uh, CDN platforms. Um, that means that uh, distant users have poor performance, and if the distant users are catered to, um, they uh, cause poor performance for everybody else. So CDNs, you want to be close. Get close. Now, uh, we would like to, with this project, help with the Ripe Atlas project because probes are free even multiple probes. Digicel Fiji has now installed four RIPE Atlas probes on their network in different cities and different islands. It's fantastic information for the community and it's fantastic information for them. Um, we have assistance available for many tasks beyond setup because they give you this probe, you put it in your network, they're like, well, what do I do with this? Even technical people, I don't have time to learn how to use this. We can help and we should be helping showing people how to integrate these probes into their network monitoring and management systems, um, show them how they can use the probes to see what their visibility uh, of the network from the world is and what um, the visibility, their visibility of the network is uh, from their facilities. So, what do we got? The next steps in this is a project um, which is now uh, transformed into an APNIC operational grant. Thank you very much, APNIC, um, for extending this. Um, I'm going to take this data and uh, make it available in real time about Pacific operating the networks. How can you help? If you have stories about cables in the Pacific, telcos in the Pacific, transit arrangements, peering arrangements, CDN issues, please come tell me where have things uh, gone right, where have things gone wrong. Um, if you do not have a RIPE Atlas probe in your network and you are in the Pacific or the Pacific Rim, please come talk to me. I'll help you out. Uh, they only use around 10 kilobits per second of traffic. You do, however, need to allow them to make ping, traceroute, and HTTPS calls um, out of the network. So thank you very much for that. I'm um, conscious that we don't have much time today, so I'm going to say if you want to question me, uh, get to me afterwards, and I'm going to hand over to our friend from South Korea. Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Jean from Kisa from South Korea. For today, I'm going to share our 
trial IPv6 deployment experience on a Korean governmental website where we run it for a month. Before, going to, before looking into the contents, I guess it will be better to give you a quick information introduction of our company, KISA. KISA is a public organization, a public company under Korean government. We co-work with various ministries of Korea. Uh, one of the biggest partners is Ministry of Science, ICT, and Future Planning, of which we call MSIP for short. We have several groups and divisions within KISA. And the number of teams is approximately more than 50. So I can explain everything. But among them, maybe you guys have some ideas about KRNIC and KSART. We act as a national internet registry of South Korea. We serve CCTLD registration service and DNS service of .kr and .hanguk. We receive IP addresses, both IPv4 and IPv6, from APNIC as a member, and we give the addresses to our ISPs. Actually, I think the thing you would be interested in is that under Korean law, our ISP is uh, not allowed to receive IP addresses directly from APNIC. They should be given some addresses from us. Well, we also have IDRC, which is short for address, Internet Address Dispute Resolution Committee. And we promote IPv6 deployment for our domestic stakeholders as well, which is what I'm going to make a presentation for today. So, Yes, let's go back to the topic IPv6. This slide shows our current status of V6 deployment. We have three major ISPs which have the biggest market share within Korea. First one is Korea Telecom, and second one is SK Telecom and Broadband under SK Group, and third one is LG Plus. And among them, speaking of IPv6 deployment, SK Telecom was our first mover. They have deployed IPv6 on their LTE they took two years ago in 2014. And last year, Korea Telecom has started their LTE v6 service as well. Now, fortunately, we have more than 6 million devices which have v6 native address. Oh, connection, sorry. Also from last year, Three cable TV providers have started to give V6 addresses to their subscribers. They are CJ Hello Vision, CNM, and Hyundai HCN. It was one of our supportive projects from of KISA. We provided them a government grant on 50-50 basis as a matching fund. And I would say it's over our V6 deployment because I can't tell, speaking of fixed line wired V6 internet service, it is not being provided very well. Well, our ISPs are saying that we can provide it because um, we are ready, we are ready on our core. Customers can get V6 when or if they want. But basically, as you know, customers don't care about V4 or V6 addresses. They just care about their services, regardless of their business, businesses or individuals. So KISA is providing basic internet connection for free of charge for organizations and companies, or yes, for individuals as well, for their trial service. This is our current status. Anyway, the number of V6 devices in Korea is increasing. Because ISPs are now moving, this slide shows from the service launch of our first mover, SK Telecom on the left here, the number of V6 devices is started to increase from September 2014. And KT participation in 2015, and then three cable providers here, and so on, is increased up to 4%. Yeah, not very high, but 
we guess we should wait for a bit more time to have satisfying numbers, but at least it's been increased. It means we are head heading to right decision, uh, uh, I'm sorry, right direction toward V6. But when we have some informal talks with our content providers as a regulatory, as a government side, we find that they are basically not interested in deploying V6. And you know what, we can't blame them for this. We all are still having difficulties in con getting more content through V6 and it, as many as we want. Big, place, big players could expect some benefits uh, I mean, big players in content providers, they may expect some benefits, but we can tell this to all content providers like small, medium businesses. Because basically they are on the customer side, they just get addresses from their ISPs and not very interested, they just care services. At least although, although we are a regulatory, we don't have plans to push or enforce our content providers. Two years ago, our content providers in South Korea didn't even have to consider V6 users, but now we have more than 6 million mobile devices on V6 native. We thought this is a time that Korean content providers should consider V6 users. If they don't, they will have to provide all the V6, uh, I'm sorry, all the V4 based service, probably through CLAT or PLAT, for example, uh, to, to all new V6 based users which may cause some bad performance. That was the reason why we operated a trial V6 service deployment on a government, Korean government website just for mobile service because there's no commercial. system. And through this project, we could wanted, uh, we wanted them to know how simple and easy V6 deployment is, and it just works without any problems. Well, generally speaking, um, many of Korean governmental websites are being operated in a data center just for government website and the name of data center is NCIS, National Computing and Information Service. Our another goal was to give operational experiences to NCIS because they can influence on all the Korean government websites or systems. But NCIS becomes very sensitive and careful when it comes to service stability and it's natural we should understand them. They didn't want to touch a single line of configuration for IPv6 deployment at all. So it may sound strange, but we decided not to change current V4 legacy system at all. Instead, we made a new V6-based system corresponding to the legacy one of V4. And then let's assume that the data center is being provided three internal lines like this slide, they are only receiving V4 addresses from ISPs, no V6 connection. So we configured a 624 tunnel to our six, uh, A6 internet in Kisa. For your information, we are running a kind of IX to provide IPv6 connection to our domestic companies and individuals. So this is a rough, rough architecture of the deployment. We made the same V6 system over here and as before one, the architecture is overall the same, including specific software and hardware. As I mentioned, the difference is that V6 system used our internet connection via tunneled network up here, upside the V4 internet. But because of the architecture described, there were some problems and two of the biggest ones were that first, resource synchronization. They were using software for content management, a bit specific one, and when the database needs updates, they should make updates on all the systems and if any connection fail, of course, the update will not be made. Well, I'm not going to explain this in detail because it's not just, not because V6, 
It was ju just because of special design of phase six deployment we made, and also because of our sensitivity of NCIS service stability. If you want to know more about this, please draw me an email. And second problem was some components, some components on the system without basic support. Well, it was not the major ones, um, like DNS bind or Apache or Tomcat, they all support V6, as you know, but some of, speaking of some third party solutions like contents management solutions and some domestic database solutions, they didn't support V6 environment. We had no choice but to make a connection up before only for those systems which doesn't support before. So external connection was based on IPv6 only, but we had to make v4 partial inside. Those two were the problems we faced during the deployment progress. So in this, in this environment, could we expect good performance? We try to figure out that, but okay, I'm a presenter here, but I don't have every answer about V6, but we, sh we just try to know what happens out there. And if anything else are the same under this condition, our question was, but could we expect good performance as well as V4 and 6? So let's see the results without numbers unfortunately. This represents the amount of incoming traffic during the trial deployment for a month. As you see, V4 amount of traffic is far more than V6. Those valleys here are just weekends. And this is the number of users, incoming users. V4 users were, was, uh, the number of V4 users was still more than V6 users, and V6 users below here is mobile users through SK Telecom and Korea Telecom. And this is the comparison of HTTP response time from the server. And this is the point we found because V6 connection was far slower compared to V4 one. We found some bad speed of V6, in, and in order to see it accurately, we started to measure V4 response time as well from the ninth or tenth day of our trial. At first, we didn't measure V4 at all for several days, because our first purpose was just to see it's just working without problems, but we saw some bad connections, so we started to measure V4 as well. Well, we were a bit naive about it. Anyway, V6 was far slower than IPv4. And for me, the interesting thing was for download speed of files, they were a bit similar. I, um, those connection on IP, ISP2 showed better download speed regardless of V4 or V6, while IP, I, I, I'm sorry, ISP1 showed comparatively bad worse speed. But in the graph, you can see that for ISP1, V4 and V6 download speed were very similar to each other, but for ISP1, ISP2, it has some difference. I'm gonna share this one. The, the interesting point was hop counts, the number of hop counts. When we trace routed the number of hop counts from the user to the trial server, through V4, it was approximately three or four. And through V6, the hop counts were more than 15. And when we checked the geography information based on who is database, we found that V6 traffic went abroad while V4 traffic went directly to the server. And this is RTT comparison by, conducted by APNIC Labs. And when we tried our best to figure out the reason why we just found something interesting, well, by chance, APNIC measurement of RTT comparison. When you see in the map here, 
the greener means IPv6 is comparatively faster, and, uh, more, and more red means IPv4 is comparatively faster, and gray means somewhat similar. I guess APNIC labs measured RTT from APNIC in Australia as a source, and the destination was some servers in each country. Just guess. Anyway, we found that in Korea, the difference of RTT between V4 and V6 was nearly the biggest in the world. As far as I read, the number of samples were far different for each country. For some countries, it was measured by just for one or two samples, but at least for Korea, the, sample, the number of samples was approximately 3,000. And it means IPv4 is comparatively very fast in Korea, but IPv6 is very slower. Mean RTT difference was 231 milliseconds. So I'm going to share our, this experience and conclusion. It was, fortunately, the trial service of us was at least reliable. We didn't find connection failures in the server logs and com no complaints from the customers. I mean users. However, V6 connection was notably slower than V4. We found that web browsers firstly try to access the website by V6 if it's dual stacked, unless from CLAT, and then fall back to V4 because they weren't able to make the connection until the happy eyeball time limit. Maybe it was 300 milliseconds. So we tried to figure out why. And then we found this far difference of the number of BGP paths of V4 and V6 inside Korea. This is APNIC VZAS. I guess some of you already know about it. It shows the number of BGP peerings between autonomous systems based on Oregon's route view project as far as I understand. On the left, you can find many connections through V4. It's the example of Korea. And on the right, there's nearly no pass uh, through V6. And when you can see, uh, when you see the right side, AES, it's too small, but AES17832, it's which has the most pass through V6, is KISA, not our big ISPs, like Korea Telecom or SK Telecom. And we found that KT, which is AS4766, just has one BJP pass here. And SK, which is AS9644, where is it? Yes, also has just one pass. It means they are not peered through IPv6. Those are the examples just for comparison. From the up left, from the up left, it's Belgium, Germany, Australia, and America. You can see the difference between in Korea. It's comparatively a big, bigger. Yeah, we found out that our ISPs have deployed V6 on their own networks, but they are exchanging traffic each other just on IPv4 basis. The IPv6 traffic exchanging was blocked by their policies, and that was the reason we think, we think about it. That was the reason about this big difference of performance between V4 and V6. So in most of the cases, traffic comes to KISA, and then when abroad far away when it comes to V6, it means even though content providers in Korea deploy V6, they'll provide worse service. Well, I can say that when users in Korea Telecom, when users Korea Telecom wanna go to server, wanna go to a server in Korea Telecom, it goes fast. But users in Korea Telecom wanna go to the server in other ISPs in Korea, it goes abroad. We made an experiment on some other examples and found that. 
Anyway, we are not able to compare V4 and V6 performance very fairly, I think, because in the network outside, there was a factor we can control and we just can observe. Anyway, as we see, it was the interconnection between our ISPs. We are now trying to solve this problem and then figure out which other factors can cause this difference. We are trying to convince the top tier ISPs as a regulatory to make IPv6 BGP peering to make more V6 pass inside Korea. Jane, we have uh, one more presentation to go back, like to wind up something. Okay. Um, okay, I will pass this slide. Anyway, this is what we, what we found. And I'm here to share our experience as a, just a case. And I'd like to know about your peering experience or V6 trial deployment experience to share each other and then get some feedback. And we are, we are going to um, develop this situation for future. So we are, we are going to conduct next experiment and we are designing and we are finding which factors can influence on the V6 and V4 traffic quality. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry for being a bit nervous. Actually, I'm a newcomer of APNIC and this is my first time to Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, so um, thank you for listening to my presentation. And if you want, if you have any idea of our experiments and trial deployment and your peering experience, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Jeff Houston to continue his presentation for the day. We have ten minutes, right? You ready? I'll move quickly. I need slides. Thank you. Um, yesterday there was a session on performance and for some reason, thanks to the program committee, they decided to schedule this presentation on performance into this slot about operations. God knows why. I don't either. Um, so this is actually a talk about performance. And what I'm looking at in particular is that age-old question that keeps on coming back. We heard yesterday from LinkedIn that somehow inside LinkedIn they defy gravity and V6 goes phenomenally faster than V4. Is it true? Is it real? What's going on out there? And there are two kind of questions that I think all of us have when we look at this whole issue of the dual protocol stacked world. How reliable are V6 connections? Do they work as well as V4? And how fast are they? Are they as fast as V4? Are they faster? Are they slower? So, I can qualify this a little more. When we talk about reliability, I'm actually talking about the TCP connections actually complete. So, I send the initial SYN, remember this is TCP, protocol dynamics, you're meant to say ACK, I'm meant to say ACK, we have a connection. That should work all the time, shouldn't it? But it doesn't, not all the time. What's the failure rate? And secondly, with speed, we're going to talk about how fast is V6 versus V4. How do I do this? Atlas, I think, has about 10,000 odd measurement points around the world, maybe 15, it's a fair few. Um, we do it slightly differently. We actually embed active measurement scripting inside an online ad. And then we use the ad network to distribute that script across the entire internet. The script generates a sets of URLs to fetch, and those URLs are aimed at a number of servers that are distributed around the globe. Currently, we have a measurement server in Singapore, not Australia, Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, uh, one in Dallas and one in Frankfurt, and evidently we're bringing out one in Buenos Aires in the next week or so. So if you ever see this ad, and this is an ad that will come up, don't click on it. Because like all online ads, I pay if you click. 
If you don't click, I don't pay. I'm like, this is brilliant. Thank you, Google. You know, a masterpiece of being a parasitic advertiser. So this is phenomenally effective. Um, when the ad actually fires up, in the background, I download a bunch of URLs for that user to load. They don't see it. This is completely invisible. And they're really, really simple URLs. It's a one-by-one one GIF. It couldn't be smaller. It's invisible. You can't see it. But they're special. Because one of them is only accessible in dual stack. One of them is only accessible in V6. If you haven't got V6, it won't come. And one of them is V4 only because that's a control. Back at the server in Singapore, Singapore, uh, back at the server in Singapore, I run full packet dumps. I record every single packet in and out, same in Dallas, same in Frankfurt. That's a lot of packet dump work. But I know what's going on to not only the millisecond, to the microsecond. So I'm in instrumenting the network back at the servers watching these clients. Google is amazing. It's one of the richest companies on the world and 97% of its income comes from advertising. They're bloody good at it. They're really good. I get hits from the Faroe Islands. I didn't even think there were people there as well as sheep. We do around seven to eight million ads a day and we see the entire internet continuously. So we have this phenomenal view over all of the internet and we use it for measurement. How reliable are these connections? Well, I can test this by seeing if you can complete the handshake. Most of the time, the packets get to me. This is good. I answer. I expect the completion of the handshake. Sometimes it's busted. And so what you actually see is you can actually measure the performance rate of connections. So at this point in, VC, in V4, 0.2% of connections fail, one in 500. Why? Well, it's not auto-tunneling. It's probably not lousy CPE. It's probably asymmetric routing. What about V6? Really bad. Really bad. Um, when you actually sort it out, one of the most common problems with V6 is tunneling. Any transition approach that uses tunneling means V6 is completely stuffed. You shouldn't use it. 6 to 4 is horrible. Teredo is horrible. Any form of tunneling is horrible. Either run native mode dual stack or forget it because tunneling doesn't work. Its performance is shocking, and as you see, the blue line is six to four. How good is six to four? 20% failure rate. Why do you hate your customers? 20% failure rate isn't a service. You get rid of all of that, and you get back to basic V6, 1.5% failure rate. That's still pretty bad. You know, it's seven times V4. So why is it happening? Lousy CPE, tunnels, strange filters, all of those are part of the V6 issue. But there's another way of looking at it, because that 1.5% is the world average, and it's not the same all over the world. If you happen to live in Paraguay, life is not good, nor is it in Kenya or Bhutan, even China. Any of these parts of the map that aren't coloured grey have a problem in V6. Here's the table. Israel, 18% failure rate for V6 in Israel. Wow. Brazil, Sudan, Sri Lanka. Oops. For the country, it's about a 7% failure rate. That's a lot. One in 12. Uh, if you're listed there, Vietnam, 3.8%, you're doing something wrong. This should not be happening. Um, even Malaysia at 2%. Taiwan, 2.5%. So I can even isolate this. I have very good visibility down into the networks. Uh, if you're a customer of Tele Columbus in, in Germany, 82% failure rate in V6. I think that's atrocious. Uh, similarly, Global Village Telecom in Brazil. Uh, more locally, uh, our friends at Learn in Lanka, Sri Lanka here, 14% failure rate. Um, yeah, something's going on there. Um, probably we can help. Uh, if you're listed here, um, you should really look about how you're doing V6. You shouldn't be listed here because these are really high failure rates. 
This is saying V6 doesn't work very well because most of the time it's actually not completing a connection. So that's the first sort of part of this. They are one-shot measurements. It's not a consistent smoke ping. I'm not sort of pummeling at the network. I'm just taking individual measurements. And it's likely that a lot of the problems are in the equipment that people use on site. So you can send out the packets, but you've got some crazy old Linksys or Belkin nonsense, which means the packets don't get back. Sometimes it's not the network operator's fault that the failure rates are so high. Because if it's a network failure, it would probably be 100%. But anyway, we are looking, we are watching, we understand this is going on, and yes, it is a real issue of concern. So that's the reliability issue. I now have two minutes. Uh, I'll see if I can do performance even faster. Um, when you actually look at this TCP connection, there's a three packet exchange. I receive a packet, I send a packet, I receive another packet. The time distance between those two packets that I receive is one RTT, one round trip time interval. I store it. So now I understand an RTT between me and you. This is good, it's a single measurement point, but it is good. So now, there's another part of this experiment which we'll go back to. What did I did? I did three tests. A V4 test, a V6 test, and a dual stack. I have two measurement points for you if you do V6. I have a V4 RTT and a V6 RTT between the same two endpoints. So it's like driving from you know, building A to building B using a different car but it's still building A and building B. These are still the same endpoints. Intuitively, ha, 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 you would expect that between these same two endpoints, somewhere in Seoul versus somewhere in Singapore, Singapore, uh, you would expect the network paths to be approximately the same and you get the same answer, wouldn't you? That's what you would expect. Um, I tried this in my office. And the Australian Academic and Research Network are kind enough to, uh, to lend me an office because I don't live in Brisbane, I live down in Canberra. And I actually checked out the performance for, for this local network and the server in Singapore. And pretty typically for Australia, most of the traffic bounces off the west coast. And in V4, that's the case. It takes about 325 milliseconds in V4. 325 milliseconds. That's okay. When I do the same thing in V6, wow. It's 213 milliseconds. Why? Because they're so clever, they do V6 only routing for me, and they send the traffic up to Singapore along CMEWE 43 or 4, and they send it back via the US. So all of a sudden, V4 and V6 do dramatically different RTTs. And it shows. It shows. So I can do this globally. And across these seven million points, I can measure the difference in RTTs day by day. And that's the graph that actually happens. On average, on average, V6 is around 10 to 20 milliseconds slower. I have no idea how LinkedIn reckons V6 is so fast, because it's not. It's about the same, just a little bit slower on average. Now, averages lie. You know, on average, the world, I think, is male, isn't it? 50.1% males versus 49.9% females. On average, we're all men, right? Wrong. Averages lie. And similarly, trying to pull out an average for this kind of number is statistically, I think, a little bit weird. And so what I've tried to do is look at the mean standard deviations. What's the level of variation? So while it's certainly true V6 is around 10 to 20 milliseconds slower, the first mean standard deviation, which covers, what, 45% of sample points, makes that kind of plus or minus about another 10 to 15 milliseconds. So within one mean standard deviation, they're about the same for the world. And that's the kind of world figure. So what you see is there's a middle point where most of the measurements sit, and then slightly out, slightly out, at approximately 20 milliseconds slower is another peak. Someone's doing weird things in routing all over the planet. Okay. Like I said, we get a lot of measurement points. And we can geolocate your address. So we know where you live. And this is the data that you were talking about with Korea about the relative performance of V4 and V6. 
Green means that V6 is unbelievably faster, up to 60 milliseconds faster uh, in Chile. Um, Christ, what is that? The Sudan? Um, Venezuela? Um, bits of Sweden are pretty good. Where it's bad, South America or sort of around Peru and Ecuador, China, South Korea, Indonesia. But these are averages, right? So we can look a little bit harder and we can drill into networks. If you're listed in one of these networks, V6 is a lot slower than V4. There's a problem going on. You could probably help. Um, uh, there are a few there that I know the folk are in the room. If you're listed here, really think about what you're doing and how you're routing V6, because it's probably not optimal. It's a lot slower than V4. Sri Lanka. Um, this is the uptake for Sri Lanka in V6. And as you notice, V6 has sort of moved on a lot in the last few months. The folk doing the sims out there, Dialog, Dialog has done a huge amount of work and around 6% of Dialog customers are running V6. But when we look at the performance of V6 versus V4, it's just a little bit slower. It's varied a lot over time and there was an issue at the first part of the year where the V6 routing was, was all over the place to get to Singapore. But it's now largely under control. And what we now see is down the bottom there, two peaks. So Dialog has kind of got it right. Their V6 and V4 paths are largely congruent. But notice that peak out there at what looks to be about 50 milliseconds slower. Someone's doing asymmetric routing again and sending V6 probably the wrong way to get to Singapore, bouncing off Europe or something similar that actually adds that additional amount of RTT. So that's the list of providers and that's the RTT differences I see per provider. That was just Sri Lanka. You can also do the same for the United States and I have. Um, the big one there is Comcast. They do an incredibly good job. The second largest provider there is of course dear old AT&T they do a really strange job. I've no idea how they engineer their V6, but somehow there's, and it's only to Dallas, the paths internally in the United States to get to Dallas in AT&T's network. Most folk do a fine old job, it's about four milliseconds slower, but a small number of AT&T customers seem to be routed via, I don't know, Greenland, Venezuela, somewhere a long way away, because 60 milliseconds of delay gets you a long way down a fiber path. They're professionals, they do this for a living. Um, so what can I say about all of this? Is IPv6 as good as V4? Yeah. I don't buy the LinkedIn story. It's not that good. It's faster about half the time, sort of, within a few milliseconds, as long as you're doing unicast. If you're doing any kind of tunneling, forget it, it's a joke. Is it as good? Yeah, no, not really, could be better. It would be a whole lot better. There's a huge amount of connection failure rate in V6, which is not very good. So, you know, if you can make the connection, you're okay, but the odds of making the connection are still largely biased in favour of V4, and that's what we see out there. That's it. If you're running a network and you're kind of interested in your service provider or what's going on, uh, that URL is probably your friend. It's updated every day. It adds another 8 million sample points every single day to the numbers. Uh, if you drill down, you can find your country, you can find your local network provider, you can find your competitors, you can find anything you want, have fun. The data's all in JSON. You can deconstruct it and make your own maps, Jonathan. Anything you want, that's fine by me. Enjoy it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think um, we haven't given you much time to ask questions, uh, so you can bump, bump it up in with the lunch time uh, with all the speakers. I want to thank uh, everybody uh, and all of you for joining the session.